turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke in chapter 1. Amen. There are going to be maybe a week or two in here. Go up just a touch. There's going to be a week or two in here that we may have to make a few adjustments. If you hadn't noticed, we've got some new screens up here. We've got some new screens in the back, and we are starting to get our new sound system and our new technical things going. So give us a little bit of grace in some of the changes that are being made. Luke, in chapter 2, we are going to start in verse 1 today. I am so excited to be able to be here and to preach on Christmas Eve morning, to when we come together and we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as it was in that day, to whenever that Jesus was born, there was joy, there was gladness, and there should still be joy and gladness within our hearts today. I'd like to go ahead and pray this morning, even before I get into the Word. Let us join in heart. Father God, as we come to you and that we commemorate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ on this day today, Father. God, we come to you and ask that you would cause this to leap to life within our hearts, God. That there might be that spark, God, that sets off the flame and the fire of our faith, God. That this here, God, we still have the hope, God, that you have sent us the gift of your Son to take us from the sin of this world. God, to remove us from that and to put us into your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know that we've got all kinds of gifts at home and things and meals to go to and celebrations. But let's not forget the reason why that we are celebrating. And I'm so sad to say that in society today, we have taken Christ out of Christmas and we've made it Xmas because we've removed Christ from the center of our celebration and we put everything else in front of that. But in all reality, Christ is the reason for the season in His coming. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1, says this, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this tax was first made when um, Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. That is so important for us to see from a prophetic point of view because David and Mary both were in the lineage of David. They were the offspring of King David. That was important because as they went to Bethlehem, the city of David, that's where they had to go to register to be taxed. Even though they, they lived 70 miles away in Nazareth, they had to go there and it wasn't an easy task to go that distance it may not seem like anything today, but in those days, it was much more complicated to get to a different place. It may have taken a little more time, but you know, that's where they had to go to be able to be taxed because of their lineage connecting them to David, connecting them to the Messiah and the Savior of the world. And it says in verse 5, to be taxed with Mary and his espoused wife, being great with child, Mary at this time was getting ready to be birthed, the Christ child. She was ready. She was great with child. So this was not just simply a task that they were going to go. They had to make sure she was taken care of and protected on this way as that they went. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Wow. That that baby was going to be born in a manger. But why was that? That it was going to be delivered and born in a manger. And she brought forth her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for him in the end. For them in the end. Chris has already asked the question this morning. Have you made room in your heart for that Christ child today? I pray that you have. This should be an exciting time of the year for us. 
It may not be the exact time whenever that Jesus was born. And, but this is the time that there again, that we commemorate the birth of our Lord and Savior, that we set time aside to be able to remember that Jesus is the reason for the season in which that we celebrate that He was birthed into this world to remove us, to take us from our sin, to cover us with His own blood. Jesus was born in that manger because there was not a place for Him as a king to be born into a nice palace or a nice room even at the end. No, He had to be born out there in a manger amongst the other sheep, amongst the other lambs, amongst the other livestock. But as we see this morning, and it says in verse 8, and there, was, and there was in those same countries shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the field, over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. They were absolutely scared out of their wits. Whenever that this angel appeared. But you know, anytime that an angel of the Lord appears, generally there is comfort that that angel brings to when he says in verse 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. This is all people. This is what God's plan was from the foundation of the world. God used the Jewish people to show forth His format, but ultimately His goal was that salvation would come to all people. Jesus was born in a time to whenever that the Jews looked down at the Gentiles as though they were dogs. They were nothing. Because we are God's chosen people. But yet that was really a wrong way to look at certain issues. Because you know, God loves all people. He chose the Jewish people to be able to set forth what He had planned from the very beginning to bring salvation into the world. God still has a plan to this day for the Jewish people. He is not through with them. He's not forsaken them. He's not gotten rid of them. Because He still has that end time plan for them and that is going to be fulfilled. And I believe that it's going to be fulfilled soon. Soon and very soon. But at this time, we see that Jesus... When He is born, there is the proclamation that the Christ child is being born, but that great and joyful news in which that we as all people should be rejoicing about today and is that we are here celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As if we come here today to commemorate His birth, we know that He's no longer in that manger. I want you to know He's no longer on that cross. He's no longer in that tomb. He is risen. He is alive and He is well. We can look into Acts and chapter 1 and we can see that He is risen and He is risen into the heavenly places to where He sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. He sits on the right hand of the Father God Almighty. And as if He is there today, He sees your commitment to Him today as if we celebrate His birth and His entrance into this world. I'm going to read that verse 10 there. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lay in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Now not only the proclamation of the angel takes place, we see the angel making this proclamation, but when there begin to be praise and thank, all of a sudden, the heavenly hosts begin to show up. And I cannot even imagine the glory that must have been revealed from heaven on high that day. Because this is the Shekinah glory that is shining down 
from God above and is that he is revealing the birth of his son. Wow, what a statement. We generally just give cigars when we have a birth. But when Jesus was born, God the Father sent the angels to worship and to praise and to sing thanks to God. As we come today to celebrate that birth, let us rejoice in knowing that He is alive and well still to this day. God's plan has never went off track. It is right on track. In fact, you may think the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, and that it may. But I want you to know God is still in the center of control of what is going on right now. Even in our world today, we see how that things are going awry in other nations and nations coming against Israel. Israel is surrounded by her enemies. But we know that these are the signs of the seasons of the things that are to happen. And Jesus said, when you begin to see these things, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. That means it's coming close and even closer than you can imagine. How many Christmases have we celebrated? Don't answer that. Some of you are here today. Tonight. I don't want to tell them how old I am, how many Christmases I celebrated. But let this Christmas be a special Christmas because I see things happening that this birth pains are getting closer and closer together to His second advent, His second coming, to His catching away in the church which is a glorious thing that the church should be looking for and excited about. How many of us here today have that hope within our heart as that we celebrate Christmas together with our family and with our friends? Let us rejoice in knowing that God is in the midst of us right here and now. Amen. When you are with your family, He is there. When you are by yourself, He is there. For He has told us, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God is that ever-present help in a time of need. And if you're ever in need, we need to call out to a God who can answer prayer. Amen. And He has answered prayer. But His sovereign will will still yet carry through even over and above what our wishes might be. I pray that things would change in our world today for the better. But we know that as the Scripture tells us, things are not going to be so good. But our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in Christ and in Christ alone. I mentioned in Sunday school this morning, we need to understand that government is not going to be our answer. Politicians are not going to be our answer. Christ is our answer. I want to encourage you to vote when the time comes. Absolutely, I think you need to vote for people who are going to stand up for the principles that you believe in. Absolutely. But our hope is not in that politician. Our hope is in the Christ child in which was born in that manger because He ultimately will be the ruler of all things. Keep your hands right there in Luke chapter 2, but turn with me if you would to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5 in your Old Testament. It was prophesied, even in the Scriptures, where that the Christ child would be born. Now, I've already read this Scripture last week, some of the other times, but, but this is important to understand that God's Word remains true and the prophetic Word in which came forth was fulfilled. Because in Micah in chapter 2 it says this, or chapter 5, I'm sorry. Chapter 5 and verse 2 it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephraim, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me. God is saying shall come forth unto me. That is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That word everlasting there actually boils down to the days of eternity. Wow. You know, we can maybe get a picture of eternity forward, but how many of us here today can really get an understanding of eternity past? You know, I can't really understand that because I know when I was born, I was born in 1963. 
So from 1963, from when my time of existence started, I can kind of say, okay, yeah, I can even believe in eternity forward, but how can we believe in eternity past? I don't understand that. And if you tell me you do, I may call you a liar. Why is that? Because we operate off of a finite mind of what the God has given us. We are created from the dust of the earth, from dust were we created, and to dust shall we return. And you know what? I don't think all that dust can handle a God type of understanding in His wisdom. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. How can we even begin to comprehend? And I understand God has given us wisdom of science. I believe in science. Amen? We have a weatherman right back here who can tell us what the weather's going to do if the weather acts right. But if God chooses so to change it, He'll do it. He doesn't have to check with the weatherman. He knows what's going to happen. Right. Amen? Clint, I'm glad you're here today. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I hope you can say the same thing after this service. Like, Mom, what did you get me into? Today? <laughs> we love you, brother. That's why. Amen? We love your family. Go back over to Luke in chapter 2 there real quick. I'm going to have some other scriptures in the Old Testament. But I just wanted to look at that once again. And it says there in verse 13 and 14, to where it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. That is what God wants for us. When we get to heaven, I don't think there's any of us that can truly understand because our minds will not comprehend it the glory in which that He has prepared for us and who believe. We live in this fallen world. We live in a world that has sin, doubt, unbelief. But yet in heaven, there will not be need for unbelief because we will be there in heaven with Him. Why do we hope? Romans chapter 8 talks about why would we hope for that that we do see. But when we still hope for that, that's why we do. We hope for that which is to come. Because this life should hold as a Christian for us no luster in this world. Now we have to make our way through this life. We have to live our lives and we have to move on. But we should always have it in the prospects of eternity. Of the decisions that we make every day. Am I doing right by this individual? How can I help someone out of where they're at in their hard times? Or are we simply saying, what can I get out of this world while, while I'm going through it? If that's your attitudes towards life, I severely would ask you this morning, check your heart to see where you are at with God. Because God wants you to give you the desires of your heart, but if the desires of your heart are not within the desires of what God would have for you, then you need to get your life right with God to where that you can be on the straight and narrow path and make sure that you are going to heaven and not on the path to hell. Wide is the path that leads to destruction, and many there be that are thereon. But narrow is the gate that leadeth to righteousness, and few there be that find it. Amen. Didn't know you was going to hear a Christmas message like this today, did you? Amen. But I'm telling you the truth. These things that we look at this morning, and these are things that have already happened with the angels. These things are written down that we might know and have the assurity that Jesus is the Christ, that He is the Messiah, that He is the Savior of the world. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, there again, the Scriptures tells us this. It says, Therefore, the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God with us. God with us. Do you realize that Jesus is God? He is just as much God as God the Father. Just as much of God the Holy Spirit. That's why when we baptize, even as that He commanded us to do, to baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 
Because these three are one. They are united in the effort in which that they do. When Jesus was upon this earth in John chapter 17, He looked up and He prayed to the Father that He might be glorified with the glory even that He had from before. Before the world was, we can't even imagine because we saw Jesus in His humanity. But when we see Jesus in His glory, I'm telling you, there is nothing like it. You look in the book of Revelation and you will see the glory of God that is upon Him. The vesture that He will have that has been dipped in blood. He has a name that nobody else knows. But He has upon His vesture, it says, a King of kings and the Lord of lords. We here today have the opportunity to worship Him. To praise Him. To glorify Him today. Amen. And so we celebrate the birth. His birth into this world. Isaiah in chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 through that says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government, and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this wow you see the word Jesus goes back to Joseph or goes back to Joshua in the Old Testament, which goes back to the meaning of deliverer or savior. But there again, Jesus was known as Emmanuel, God with us. And what was he doing but delivering us and saving us? So when we look at his name and we see that, that's why there is no other name above the name of Jesus. And by his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. In this Christmas season in which we celebrate, let us remember that God had a plan. Let me go ahead and read there from verse 15 in Luke chapter 2 to where it says, And it came to pass as that the angels were gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said one to another, Let us go now. Go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, they came quickly, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they, knew, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. I want to mention at this point there again, there was a sign that was given unto them that the babe would be wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now this was different sheets or different things, wrappings. And this is actually what that they did with the lambs whenever that they were born. They would take them little lambs and they would wrap them up to where they couldn't hurt themselves and it also protected them. Another thing in the Middle Eastern culture, they would do this because they were trying to protect the baby's organs. It believed to protect the baby's organs inside. So it also gave them comfort and it was cuddled like that. But this was not just simply... A baby, it was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Wow. Takes away the sin of the world. This was a sign that the angel said, when you go find this, you're going to find this babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. There it is. They go find that baby. They find it laid in that manger and wrapped up just like a little lamb that they would wrap up. This is one of the questions that I wanted to ask today. Could these have been the shepherds who supplied the lambs for the temple sacrifice 
that were performed for the forgiveness of sins. Could these have been the shepherds that were raising those lambs that were to be sacrificed? They were there to witness the birth, or actually the birth that already happened, but yet they were there to take account of the lamb that would be slain from the foundation of the world that would take away our sin. Your sin, my sin, the sins of the whole world if they will accept the Savior, the Messiah. Wow, what an awesome God to be able to do this. Still yet today, that blood still flows for you and for me. We need a Savior. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how good looking you are. God doesn't care. What God cares about is your heart. Is your heart ready to receive the sacrifice that He made for you and for me? Because without that, we can be the best person in the world. I mentioned this in Sunday school this morning. We can be the best moral individual that you may think. Well, I haven't done anything wrong. I've not done wrong by anybody. But if you don't know Jesus, you just look good before you go to hell. Because we need a Savior. We need that sacrifice in which He made. The sacrifice in which He was born into this world for us to receive. And when we receive that sacrifice and we receive Him into our lives, we become changed. We receive Him and ask Him forgiveness. And please cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. That we might enter into the heavenlies. There's going to be more people in heaven than what you think. Because there may be people that you think are not really ready for it, but yet God has prepared their heart. And then there's other people that you may think, well, they're good people. I know they're Christians. I had someone years ago tell me, oh, I can tell they're Christians. They're good people. I'm like, I hate to even tell you this, but it was my dad. He, oh, they're, they're good people. They're Christians. And, and you know what? I know a lot of good people that will outright tell you, I'm not a believer. I don't believe in that at all. But they have good moral standards. They have good moral stance. But yet if they don't have Christ, they are still as lost as lost can be. I'm going to start driving the point home even more and more because I want to see salvation through our church, through the people that come and hear the Word of God, that they know they need a Savior and that they need salvation. I don't want to just be preaching to the choir. I want to be preaching to the lost and the dying who need Jesus. And that is what our church should want in their hearts. We need to support one another. We need to support those who are weak in the faith. But we also need to be reaching out to those who don't have understanding of Jesus in their life. That they need Him as well. And I think about that babe in that manger and whenever that those, those shepherds came in verse 17 here, and it says, and when they had seen it, they went and knew and noised abroad, or knew abroad, saying, which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary pondered these things within her heart. What will this child be? What will this child do from all the things that have taken place from the miraculous conception to the being able to have Joseph accept her because of her being pregnant outside of wedlock? What will this child be and as she pondered these things, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. They had been told these things because the Scriptures had already professed them in the Old Testament. Turn with me if you would to Galatians and chapter 4, starting in verse 4 through 6, says this. I'll give you a moment to get there. Galatians chapter 4, 
starting in verse 4, says this, the writings of Paul, but when, the, but when the fullness of time was come. Now just think about that statement right there. But when the fullness of time was come. Do you know they had been looking for the Messiah? They had been wondering when He was going to appear. And there was a couple of hundred years in there to where there was no prophetic word that had been spoken. But yet there was still the hope that the Jewish people who held faith was believing that He would come. But it says when the fullness of time was come. I would like to say at this point, there's still a fullness of time that is to come even for the end time prophecies to be fulfilled that shall be seen. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into their hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That is an intimate wording, and it's almost like saying, Daddy. Because of the intimacy that is there, crying, Abba, Father. How many of us have loved our fathers? And I know there's some here today who had mean fathers, who didn't have fathers that were necessarily there for them. But you know, those, are, those of us that are here who had close relationships with our fathers and loved our fathers, we could go to them when we were hurt. We could go to them when we had joy. We could go to them and know that they would receive whatever that we had to say. That's what a godly father should be. But unfortunately, once again, we live in a fallen world. But God has already told us, even through His Word, that when the fullness of time was come, when the fullness of time was come, as Sherry comes back to the piano to lead us in song this morning, Brother Chris, if you'll prepare to come, the last Scripture that I would like to bring up this morning is in John in chapter 1 and verse 14. John in chapter 1, verse 14, which just simply says this. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. And we beheld Him. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. As we sing today, as Chris leads us in song, let our hearts be open to hear what the Spirit may be speaking to us today. In recognition of what we have to come. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and you've never accepted Him, take this opportunity today. I don't know every one of you here today. And some of you that I do know, Maybe there's hidden parts of your heart that you need to say, all right, Lord, here I am. I accept you and I receive you as my sacrifice for sin. That's why you entered into this world. Chris, lead us in song today. Thank you. 
Oh, friend.